cohort who I see, so I'm going to shut up here. Also Reggie Williams and the Levin Center and the National Endowment uh, for the Humanities. Thank you. Today we're here. <laughs> Today we're here to celebrate Dolores Huerta Day, and we just had a panel earlier, Latina, the Latina Empowerment Panel, and that was awesome. And today we're going to continue celebrating the Dolores Huerta Day with Stacey Sowards. And Stacey Sowards is a professor and chair of the Communications Department at <laughs> the University of Texas El Paso. Go Miners! She. <laughs> She is here to talk to you about her book, Si Ella Puede, The Rhetorical Legacy of Dolores Huerta and the United Farm Workers. So please join me in welcoming Stacey Sowers. Well, good evening, and thank you for being here on April 10th, 2019, which happens to be the 89th birthday and also in celebration of Dolores Huerta Day. Very exciting uh, for a lot of reasons to be here tonight, but I wanted to say this is my first time in Bakersfield, and I think it's really important for me to be here on this day, uh, given the history that Bakersfield has played in the farm worker movement, and of course because the Dolores Huerta Foundation is here, and it's Dolores Huerta's birthday, and today is Dolores Huerta Day in the state of California, and the state of New Mexico, and the state of Washington, so I'm just really delighted to be here in Bakersfield and see this beautiful city, uh, visit the mountains a little bit, and um, thank you all for being here tonight uh, on this uh, fabulous day. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit extemporaneously, which is what we do in my discipline, in the communication discipline and rhetoric, and then I'm also going to be reading a little bit from my book so that you can get a sense of what Dolores Huerta's words were actually like, and it's kind of a mix for me because I don't usually read from um, my book or from presentations, uh, but we'll try it out and see how it goes. I, I gave this talk, practiced this talk to some students at UTEP last week, and they, they seemed to think it was okay, so we'll, we'll go with that. Uh, but I want to tell you, this book came out in 2019, and, and I see some students in the audience, and one thing I want to say is that writing a book is not easy, uh, and uh, there's a lot of um, work that goes into writing a book. Uh, I don't really enjoy the writing process, even though I'm a professor, and it's a big part of what I do as an academic. Um, so I'm going to tell you that this project started about 20 years ago, in 1999, when I moved to Detroit, Michigan. and. I was planning to go to a conference in Detroit, and at that conference, um, I was going to be presenting about Dolores Huerta, and I thought, oh, I'll just go on the internet and get some of her speeches, analyze them, because that's what we do in the communication field, and then I'll give this paper. And so I went on the internet, and I was like, oh, there are no speeches by Dolores Huerta. There's no like magical archive of speeches. And that led me to, to realize that Cesar Chavez had tons of speeches, and there were so many histories and biographies written about him. And I was really, um, I don't know why I knew about Dolores Huerta, but I was pretty stunned that that information about Dolores Huerta wasn't out there as much as, obviously, Cesar Chavez. And so that led to this basically 20-year project, um, which I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, so because I was living in Detroit, I was able to go to the UFW archives. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but because Detroit houses a lot of labor unions, like the auto workers and other <coughs> unions, uh, there's actually a big labor um, library there at Wayne State University and so I happened to be living on the Wayne State campus at the time and I went over to the Ruther Library and was able to access 40 boxes of unprocessed materials about Dolores Huerta which is also interesting because none of those boxes were processed and they're still not processed today I don't think uh, but of course all the Cesar Chavez material had been processed and organized and archived but it was also exciting because I got to go through these boxes and look at all of these old, old materials from the 1960s, and uh, it was very exciting. And since then, I went to archives at UCLA and the Beinecke Library in Connecticut and a number of other places around the United States. Um, I used to live in San Bernardino and was able to see Dolores Huerta speak there in the early 2000s, 2001 to 2004. And then, of course, because of El Paso's connection to the Chicana, Chicano movement, she has been out to El Paso quite a few times, also Las Cruces, New Mexico, 
Um, so this is sort of the, how this project came about is by watching her speak and going to archives and interviewing her and watching her film and interviews and, and all sorts of um, different places where she spoke because I really wanted to look at the things that she had to say as a communication scholar. Um, so uh, in this talk, what I'm going to be doing is talking about one chapter in my book. There are a few other chapters and I'll, I'll briefly mention what those are. Um, but first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the historical context, uh, just to make sure that we are a little bit aware of why the UFW came about and why Dolores Huerta was so crucial in that process. Um, so basically, we can say that, and, then, and historians would obviously say this is much more complicated, but we can say that there are three general periods for farm, working orga farm worker organizing in the United States. Uh, so from the 1900s to the 1950s is one of the first eras where we start to see that. Although there was stuff happening in the 19th century, uh, there was a Chinese Exclusion Act that was passed in 1882 and a number of other laws that, that restricted and expanded the flow of farm workers from other nations and other countries. And so um, there's definitely things that are happening in the 19th century, but agricultural expansion, especially in the state of California, expands very significantly at the early part of the 20th century, which is why we start to see so many farm workers um, coming from Mexico, from the Philippines, and from other countries to the United States to work on those fa uh, farms. Um, in 1935, the National Labor Relations Act was passed, which was significant because it granted um, workers' rights and the right to unionize to workers except for domestic workers and farm workers. So this was a big significant exclusion for those two sets of workers and of course very important for farm workers because they weren't protected under the National Labor Relations Act. And this happened in the D Great Depression and so part of the reason why that happened is because the agricultural lobbyists were so powerful at the time and were able to exclude farm workers uh, in part because there were so many Dust Bowl migrants moving to California to work in the fields. Uh, so then we move through the 1900s, 1950s. We have Public Law 78. Probably some of you are more familiar or know that as the Bracero Program, in which Me Mexican, mostly Mexican workers were brought to the United States as temporary workers, and that continued through 1965, and that's one of the reasons why we start to see the success of the UFW in the 1960s. Uh, from 1960 to 1972, there's a lot more farm worker organizing that's happening, and there are basically three main organizations. Um, the UFW, which wasn't called that until 1972, uh, it was called the um, National Farm Workers Association and, and some other names before it actually got to the, the UFW name that we know it as today. Um, there was the AFL-CIO's, AWOC, the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, and then the Teamsters, and there was a lot of conflict between these three groups. Uh, but essentially what we saw in the 1960s were boycotts and strikes and, and some of the um, the work that you might be familiar with, uh, the famous pilgrimage, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. And then from 1972 to 1993, the UFW moves in some different directions, and that's partly because of the political climate of the time where we have um, Nixon as president, uh, there's a Republican governor in the state of California, so that's kind of restricting some of the farm worker rights in the, in the state and across the nation. Uh, but the, far the UFW starts doing more political lobbying and some other activities to bolster its cause and a little bit less of the union organizing. And there's a number of books that explore those. Uh, Cesar Chavez passed away in 1993, so that's why I sort of end there. And then what happens in, the, in that period from 93 to 2000 is, uh, if any of you have seen the film Dolores, uh, she talks a little bit about, or not, she doesn't talk about it, but Barbara Carrasco talks a little bit about how um, there was this expectation that Dolores Huerta would take over the presidency of the UFW, and that didn't happen for various reasons that I, I won't go into. Um, and so in 2000, Dolores Huerta started the foundation that's based here in Bakersfield. Um, Okay, so a little bit about Dolores Huerta's life. Uh, she was born in 1930 on April 10th, which means that she's 89 today. And uh, um, she is still very, very active, as many of you probably know, if you know anything about Dolores Huerta. Uh, but she uh, started out her life in Dawson, New Mexico. She spent about the first five years of her life there. That's where her father was from, and he remained in that area. Uh, and then she moved to Stockton, California, so her parents got divorced when she was about five and uh, she moved to Stockton, where her grandparents lived. Um, so she had a very influential mother and a very influential grandfather. They were very significant in her life. And that's important because she talks a lot about how they inspired a lot of that social justice 
cause and that spirit that she developed as a young adult. And I think that that's pretty important to think about how you're raised and how you grow up if you don't have that sort of social justice imbued in you from an early age. How does that affect your perspectives on social justice as an adult? So she, t she attributes a great deal to her mother and her grandfather in playing that role. Uh, in 1950, she earned a teaching certificate, and that was pretty significant at the time because a lot of Latinas and Chicanas, um, Me Mexicanas at the time, didn't really earn college degrees. So here she had this college degree, and she became a teacher uh, in the Stockton, California area, and that was pretty significant for that 1948-1950 period. Um, and she talks a lot about having great educational opportunities, participating in ballet and the Girl Scouts and all these extracurricular activities. Uh, so um, she attributes a lot of that to her mother as well. And then interestingly, uh, and a lot of people know this, but she was divorced twice. So her first husband um, was Ralph Head. She had two children with him. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, she divorced and she married Ventura Huerta, uh, which is where the name Huerta comes from. Um, from her second husband. She had five children with him, and then she ended up in partnership with Richard Chavez, who was Cesar Chavez's brother, and she had four more children with him, but they never married. And she was with him until 2011 when he passed away. So, uh, a little bit about her life. Uh, and in this picture here, you can see her with all of her 11 children, and you can see that there's a span of ages, right? So when we're talking about having 11 children, some of them were more adults when some of the others were younger, but still having 11 children is difficult. And in the spirit of Dolores Worth, I have my daughter here uh, watching Peppa Pig, uh, maybe in Spanish, I'm not sure. And uh, I, you know, I, I'm a single mom, so when I get invited to do talks or I have to go to conferences, I have to bring my daughter and sometimes she watches too much TV and then that's kind of how we cope as, as single moms, I guess. Um, but I think that that's important because, I, I, in a lot of ways, I think that that's what Dolores Huerta would do. She would take her kids to work. She would take them to the strike line, to the picket line, to the boycotts, and uh, to the office, and a, a, a number of other activities. So my daughter is here in that spirit. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, all right, so that's a little bit about Dolores Huerta and the historical context. And... Um, a few of the flyers. I got this from an archive at the University of Iowa. So you can see that what the UFW is doing, uh, no compre and Eagle, so not buying in a grocery store. Um, boycott grapes, give this child a chance. Americans reject grapes of wrath. And I think if you're familiar with the, the UFW history, you know that lettuce was a big target, grapes, table grapes and wine grapes. And so there was a lot of um, produce boycotting going on and in the 1960s, 1970s. Okay, so real quickly then, um, I'm gonna talk about what the book content is, and I think it's available for sale right out here. I, I guess I'm supposed to promote that. Uh, now that the book's done, I'm, I'm like, oh, you know, okay, there it is. It's, I, I haven't really thought about it too much since it came out, uh, but I am supposed to promote it a little bit. Um, so the introduction in the first chapter give the context of farm worker and civil rights movements, and that's kind of what I just talked about. Um, so there's a, a little bit more of that history. Um, the second chapter looks at more of a biography of Wetertha's life, and I talk about a theoretical concept from Pierre Bourdieu, who talks about habitus and how those early childhood experiences are so formative to us later in life. Um, chapter three looks at what I call the rhetorical functions of letter writing. So I was able to get these letters that, say, that uh, Dolores Huerta wrote to Cesar Chavez and to other people. And it's really interesting because they reveal these, these um, fascinating aspects of her life that aren't revealed in more public discourse, right? So she's talking about, you know, which babysitter is going to go with which kid and the, the electricity is about to be turned off and she's asking Cesar about what to do or telling him about her problems. And so the chapter looks at sort of that behind the scenes activity that's happening in, in those letters. And a lot of them are undated, but they're from the 1960s, 1970s. Um, okay, the, the fourth chapter, I think I skipped the third chapter. Oh, no, that was the fourth chapter. Okay, the fourth chapter looks at familia, and this is actually my favorite chapter, uh, but I'm not going to be talking about that tonight because I think the fifth chapter, which is what I am going to be talking about tonight, is so much more important for reasons I'll explain in just a second. Um, but the rhetoric of familia explores um, how Wadertha used motherhood and emotion strategically as both a constraining and enabling factor. So she had these 11 children, uh, and how does one manage to be 
a major social movement icon and raise 11 children and have grandchildren and this huge family life. And that's kind of what this chapter is looking at. But, but she did a lot of things where she would um, take her kids to meetings and use them strategically as a way to disrupt meetings. And there's a lot of really funny stories about that in this chapter and, and elsewhere. Um, so it, it is my favorite chapter because I'm so interested in how we can disrupt that narrative the good mother narrative of you know what it means to be a good mother to stay at home with the kids and have this sort of perfect life and here's what are the turning that on its head in the film in the documentary film Dolores she talks about that difficult process uh, and her kids talk about it too so it was obviously not a perfect ideal situation but it's what happened and she's the social movement icon and um, and her kids ha are successful happy adults well um, I think that they are, and uh, that's for them to decide, but I think that that's really the, um, an interesting look at things. Um, chapter five, then, is what I am going to be talking about, and that's her public persona of collaborative egalitarianism, courage, and optimism. And the reason I want to talk about this chapter tonight is because I think that a lot of our civil rights and social justice causes are under attack by various people and institutions. And so um, I think that this is the chapter where we can take away some hope and optimism for our futures and look at the words of Dolores Huerta and hopefully be inspired by them to keep up the fight. So that's why I chose this chapter to talk about. And then chapter six uh, looks at icons and social movements. So what does it mean for her to become an icon in a social movement? What is the broader context? and uh, what does that mean for today? And a lot of the intersectional movements that she participated in, the environmental movement, the women's movement, uh, the Chicano movement, and so forth. So there's a lot of intersectional aspects of identity and movements that um, she played a big role in. And then there's a conclusion chapter that's a, a theory chapter. Okay, so I'm gonna read a little bit now, and um, we'll see how this goes. If it gets too boring, I'll, I'll switch back to my more extemporaneous style. Uh, so, in order to more full, fully understand Dolores Huerta's life and rhetorical legacy, my book advances three key arguments. These three arguments form the crux of the overarching theoretical goal of this book to examine the nature of rhetorical agency and its relationship among individual actors and broader social justice activism. To begin, I understand rhetorical agency as the interplay of three facets, intersectional habitus that shapes identities, identities that solidify public personas through differential bravery, and public personas that enable collaborative social activism. To further explain, first, Huerta's iconic status originated in her early family life in which habitus or one's early life experiences have profound impact on the people we become. Her familial and educational influence coupled with her complicated yet supportive relationship with Cesar Chavez as illustrated in their private communication reflect the many ways in which habitus plays a role in one's identities and activities. The second key argument focuses on how these private identities lay the groundwork for a public persona. In the case of Huerta, her public persona involves two components, her womanhood and motherhood, and then her optimistic social justice orientation. Taken together, her rhetoric of, fa of familia and motherhood and optimism and justice form the basis of Huerta's public rhetoric and leadership styles and what I call differential bravery. Finally, I argue in the book that habitus along with private communication and identity that leads to the development of a public persona are the foundations for actors and icons within social movements. Ultimately, as I argue in today's presentation, that positionalities of collaborative egalitarianism and courageous optimism extend and build these constructs of differential consciousness and vision as a form of differential bravery. Okay, so that's uh, the, the key argument of the book. Uh, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the differential means as a theoretical concept, uh, as one that you may or may not be familiar with. Has anyone heard of the differential? Chela Sandoval, methodology of the press? Okay, so I will explain that a little bit more. Okay, um, so before I turn to Dolores Huerta as more of an illustration of what I mean by the differential, I'm gonna unpack this a little bit, uh, linking it back to rhetorical agency. So Chela Sandoval comes up with this, con this concept of differential consciousness in a 2000 book uh, called The Methodology of the Oppressed, which is one of my favorite books of all time. And she defines differential consciousness as an oppositional framework that uh, comes from the components of strength, flexibility, and grace. So that means that we have to have the strength to commit to a cause, uh, we have to be flexible, and we have to have the grace to make changes. So I'm gonna uh, give a quote from her work. 
She says, enough strength to confidently commit to a well-defined structure of identity for one hour, day, week, month, year, enough flexibility to self-consciously transform that identity according to the requisites of another oppositional ideological tactic if readings of powers formations require it, enough grace to recognize alliance with others committed to egalitarian social relations and race, gender, sex, class, and social justice when these other readings of power call for alternative oppositional stands. So Sandoval suggests then that this, um, that this consciousness is performative and that it's linked to whatever is not expressible in words. Uh, so it can be accessed in different ways. Uh, the, the performance of motherhood, for example, is one way that Dolores Huerta uses that. Um, but it's the idea that differential consciousness is a rupture or a shock um, that inspires new ideas, identities, and hope that enable actors to continue using social movement and technologies of opposition. And that's really important because that's what the UFW was able to do. They used all of these, uh, like the, the peregrinacion, the pilgrimage uh, strategy and other strategies. And you'll see that here in a, a few minutes. Uh, so then the differential consciousness that disrupts or shocks into new ways of thinking, actions and ideas is also reflected in Amy Carrillo Rowe's work on differential belonging. She's a communication scholar. Uh, so I know her work very well, probably a lot of you don't, uh, but differential um, belonging is about how we relate to other people and the politics of relation. So she says, uh, quote, the politics of relation is a placing that moves a politics of location through a relational notion of the subject to create a subject who recognizes and works within the coalitional conditions that create and might unmake her and others. And so again, the differential belonging is about how we relate with other people, but also how that forms our own identities. And uh, some of you might have been here earlier for the panel, but I think a lot of the panelists uh, at, at three o'clock today talked about um, how their work was informed by their lives and how that helped shape their identities, how their work was so important to them in that process of identity making. And that goes on for the rest of our lives. Uh, and then the last theorist, I mean, I draw on a lot of theorists in this book, so I'm not going to say the last theorist, but another theorist I draw from is the work of uh, Karma Chavez, who's also a communication scholar. And she uses this term, differential vision. Uh, so, quote, she says that turns back to political activism and social movement and requires conjoining orientation with belonging. Differential consciousness returns us to orienting toward those with politics that resist dominant and hegemonic systems of power. Combined, they create a differential vision that enables coalition building. So her argument here then is that Differential belonging and consciousness is more about the individual and what we do as actors in our societies, but how do we move that into more of a vision, social movement, coalition building to create social activism beyond just what the individual do? And if you think about your own self for a second, you might be really committed to an environmental cause. You might say, I don't use plastic straws anymore. I only use paper straws or I don't use straws at all. Uh, so that's great, but if you're the only person who does that, then what does that mean for the broader movement of environmentalism? And that's another story, right, for another day. But I think that if you can take up one cause and you're the only person doing that, what does that mean, more broadly speaking? Does that make an impact? And we hope that it does, of course, uh, but we have to get other people on board for it to have a bigger impact, and that's what Karma Chavez is talking about. And so then my contribution then is about differential courage and bravery. And that's what I'm going to be talking about through the work of Dolores Huerta. So the idea then is that you would embrace these concepts of the consciousness, the belonging, and the vision. But we also need to be a little bit brave. And so how do we get there, right? Like if we're too afraid to act, then w how do we move forward? How do we take that initial first step? And sometimes when we take that initial first step, we find out that, oh, it's not as scary and hard as we thought. Uh, we can keep doing that, and that helps us to build momentum, and that's my argument in this chapter that Dolores Huerta illustrates so well. How do we get Dolores Huerta to stand up on the top of a car holding a Welga strike sign uh, in the middle of, of fields, and how, do we, how does she do that, right? How does she get to that place where she can take that kind of action, and how can she inspire us? Okay, so the first part of the chapter um, about Dolores Huerta more specifically, then, is about uh, how she uses collaborative egalitarianism. And so I'm going to turn to that argument, and then I'll talk about the second half. Uh, so first we can say that she has talked about this herself, about how much courage it took to leave 
her paying job with the community service organization and to join Cesar Chavez in co-founding the union in 1962 when she was a single mom who had seven children knowing that she was not going to be having a stable salary. Uh, and she went on to say that the, the um, leaders of the UFW would earn five to $35 per week. And I don't know what that is in 1960, um, 2019 dollars, but I'm sure that it's not a significant amount of money. And so that's a big decision. And that took a lot of courage. She talks about having that courage to, uh, to take that risk. But she also talks about having this life of sacrifice and commitment and knowing that things would work out in the end. Um, and she had this middle class upbringing and she was equally comfort, uh, comfortable in, uh, at the time. I mean, she's still alive, so these things are still true. Uh, but she has this uh, comfort and fluidity in speaking both Spanish and English. And I think at the time, Cesar Chavez really preferred to speak more in Spanish or felt more comfortable in speaking Spanish, whereas Dolores Huerta was more comfortable in both languages. And I think anyone who, how many of you speak Spanish and English in this audience? Quite a few of you, right? So you know that there's a lot of navigation, that you get into one kind of context and you feel more comfortable in one language uh, than another. And then sometimes it's English, sometimes it's Spanish. Uh, it could be, uh, I had to give a Title IX presentation about sexual harassment in Spanish. And I was like, okay, I know all those words in English, but doing this in Spanish is, is pretty challenging, right? So you can think about um, how Dolores Huerta was able to move in both Spanish and English and how challenging that can be. Uh, if, you, if you know Spanish and English. Uh, she also had a purposeful adoption of a life of poverty, so she talks about this pretty extensively, and how it impacted her kids, right? So she would talk about how um, she would send her kids to their communions in um, dirty shoes or shoes that were too small, and how bad she felt about doing that, and, but knowing that, that, you know, that she was committed to the farm worker cause, uh, but that, that was impacting her kid's life. And then she was also deeply influenced by Catholicism and her own spirituality, and she had a very um, difficult relationship with the church because of her divorces and a number of other things, but she was also still very deeply spiritual and Catholic. Um, so that life and her rhetorical practice demonstrate her commitment to egalitarianism. Uh, that's a view that she fostered within the farm worker movement and for herself. Um, she believed that farm workers had the ability to help themselves and uh, in her 1966 Peregrinación speech that I'll, I'll show you in a few minutes, she said, conditions can be changed by only one group of people themselves. Uh, so she's really emphasizing this self-empowerment and that continues even to today when she talks about people power. And I'll give another example of that in a little bit. Uh, so she gave a couple of speeches in 1974 and these also illustrate uh, how the UFW and Wetherthe sought to both collaborate and empower farm workers. So in a speech that she gave at Stanford University, and you can imagine uh, this is kind of important, right, to think about who the audience is, right? So an uh, uh, audience at Stanford is probably a mix of educated folks in the Stanford, uh, what's the city, Palo Alto, right, uh, area, and maybe college students, maybe mostly white, maybe mostly English speaking. Uh, but, you know, there's also the Chicano movement happening at the time, so maybe some people come to the speech. So you can kind of think about who the audience is and how gifted she was in, a, in adapting her message to those audiences. So what she says in this speech, uh, quote, what I'd like to tell people that we're no longer asking anybody for charity. We're not saying to people, well, please help the poor farm workers. Chale on that. No more of that. But we say to people now, you have a responsibility to farm workers because the farm workers feed you. A farm worker puts food on your table every single day. And so you have a responsibility. So we ask you to just do a very simple thing, fast. Don't eat lettuce. Don't eat grapes. Don't drink wine. That's a very simple thing for people to do. Just don't eat those three things. I think people can do that. OK. I think we're going to have a, a candy break right now. OK, there you go, sweetie. OK. <laughs> OK. Uh, then we ask people to help pick it. Well, that's a little harder. Some people will say, well, that's not my bag. Picketing is passe. People don't do that anymore. What is picketing? Pick picketing is just walking, just like a peregrinación. You know what a peregrinación is, a pilgrimage. You're walking, you're walking for justice. And when people say to you that they don't want to walk, remind them that a farm worker has to walk thousands of miles in his lifetime to feed you, to put food on your table. 
And when he walks, he doesn't walk straight up. He has to bend over like a hairpin. When he's thinning, when he's cutting the lettuce, when he's cutting the celery, when he's picking tomatoes, he's bent over. And that's the way he's got to do it eight, nine, ten hours when he's picking cucumbers. Tell people that. And when they're picking grapes or onions, a farm worker has to walk on his knees. So tell people that if we ask them to come out and join us for a couple of hours on Friday and Saturday, that's nothing compared to what a farm worker has to go through to put food on their table. He has to work out in the heat. He has to work out there in the cold. So in this speech, what you can see is that, it, first off, it's all in English, but also she's trying to describe the farm worker life, which suggests to us that the audience is probably not uh, that familiar with the farm work process and the kind of work that goes into being a farm worker, because uh, she's trying to explain that. And then when she does use Spanish, like peregrinación, she translates that, right, so that people understand. So she uses this mixed use, mixes, mixed use of Spanish and English, audience involvement and repetitions of resistance and optimism through gritos or the shouts or rallying cries at the end of her speeches as a way to equalize speaker audience roles through collaborative egalitarianism. So at the end of her speeches, she calls for this audience involvement. Uh, and by offering the audience a way to contribute, she's able to foster a sense of egalitarianism through the collaboration in the speech making process itself. Almost all of Huerta's speeches ended with audience participation through gritos as illustrated in another 1974 speech. So if you've, how many of you have seen Dolores Huerta speak? Okay, a few of you, so you'll be familiar with this. I'm obviously not gonna do this justice, uh, but I am gonna read it as best as I can. Um, so she says, all together, huh? I'll say, viva la causa, and everybody yells viva, really loud, okay? Viva la causa, viva, ugh, that was very weak. This is very important. This is, kind, this is like kind of praying together in unison, you know, so it's really important. Let's try it again. Viva la causa, viva, viva la justicia, viva. Now so Caesar can hear us in the hospital where he's at, then the growers can hear us where they're at. Viva Chavez, viva. Okay, now we'll try abajo, down with fear, abajo, down with lettuce and grapes, abajo. Down with Gallo, abajo, you know this really works. Can we live in a world of brotherhood and peace without disease and fear and oppression? Si se puede, right? Okay, let's do it together. Si se puede. That's what it says in the transcript. Si se puede, si se puede. Okay, so none of you joined in, uh, which means that I'm clearly not as inspiring as Dolores Huerta. Okay, there we go. Uh, <laughs> but no clapping, no si se puede. And she would really get people involved, right, in that process. And I'm obviously not very good at it, and that's why I'm a university professor and not uh, 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 Dolores Huerta. Um, but I think what's so interesting about what she was able to do, okay, so I'm standing up here, and you can see that that's kind of hard to get the audience to respond, uh, because none of you responded when I asked you to respond in reading Dolores Huerta's words. Um, but what it does then is that it develops this egalitarian relationship with the audience, and it, it makes the audience more committed to the cause by forcing them to repeat and participate through words like si se puede and viva justicia. The mixed use of Spanish and English, which was quite common at the conclusion of her speeches, also galvanized audiences in both Spanish and non-Spanish speaking audience members could participate in, and the, both audiences accepted th the use of both languages. Um, by introducing a term or a phrase in either language, depending on the audience's language preferences, but usually in Spanish, and then translating, the audiences felt comfortable in their repetitions because Huerta established grounds for acceptance of this mixed use of Spanish and English. And now I think what's really important is about crowd atmosphere and contagion of emotion. Um, so her, her, she, what she does is she builds an atmosphere, right? That there's the sense of contagion of the emotion, like si se puede, viva justicia, abajo, uh, and so on and so forth, right? So there's something that's really inspiring about having to repeat those words and how it makes you feel emotionally that she was so gifted at and still is today. Um, so I uh, use the work of Sarah Ahmed here to talk about how emotions are always relational and that, quote, emotions are crucial to the very constitution of the psychic and the social as objects, a process which suggests that the objectivity of the psychic and social is an effect rather than a cause. So Wertha always attempted to galvanize the audience emotionally through differential belonging and audience participation by calling out and requiring that response, which creates the sense of, of soaring emotion that really connected audiences to the cause. Um, so for another example, uh, she gave a speech at Cal State Chico in 1977, and I'm um, just gonna quote the newspaper writer for the school paper there. Uh, the writer 
Robert Spears says, when Huerta arrived 45 minutes late, she was led on stage by a vigorous Welga clap. So that's sort of that, that you know, clap. If you've seen her speak, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, the passionate rhythm of the strike line, the clap started slowly with great steady power and then crescendoed into an outpouring of applause. And Teresa Brennan um, talks about how emotion is contagious this way, that it operates not just through the visual, but also olfactory and auditory processes of stimulation that are at work. Um, Brennan also argues that the creation of such effective atmosphere is cultural, as cultural aspects work for, within, and against the display and restraint of emotion. At the end of the 1977 Chico speech that included the regular greet those vivas y abajos, Spear notes, the audience joined hands and chanted with her, again illustrating the powerful affect generated within Huerta's audiences. How many times have you been to a public speaking event where you join hands with the audiences, right? So this is the idea that there's like this really emotional connection to the other people in the audience is, is really powerful and not very common, even though it's well, I, I, th I feel like it's very common because I've been studying Dolores Huerta for so long, but it's really, really not. Um, okay, so that gives you some ideas then of how that contagious emotion functions and, and the effect that it can have on an audience. And um, I just want to show you a couple of pictures of some of the audience. So the picture on the left is an audience, mostly, probably mostly Mexican, Mexican-American, Chicano, uh, Latina, uh, Latinos in that picture. And um, is the, I don't know what it's called, but the picture on the inside of my book. Um, and I think that's a really neat picture because we don't often think about who the audiences are. We tend to think mostly about the speaker themselves. And then over here we have a couple of pictures. Uh, we have the kind of the unif like a typical university atmosphere or a school, looks like a school gym. And up here at the top, we have uh, a picture from the Peregrinación, and we see that Cesar Chavez here in the front, and the Welga, flat, uh, the Welga and the UFW strike signs um, as, they're, as they're marching there. Uh, I, I, I don't know, I think that's really cool to think about who the audience and the participants are, because those are the people that we never talk about. All we hear about is Cesar Chavez, and sometimes Dolores Huerta, right? We don't, we don't often hear about these folks. Um, so now I want to turn to this uh, peregrinacion because it's one of the few uh, recorded images from this era. Uh, so let me just talk a little bit about this, that the UFW organized this peregrinacion or pilgrimage that started on March 10th and ended on April 10th in 1966. So that's uh, however many years ago. 53? I don't know. I can't do math on, uh, I was a math major in college, but I can't do that in my head right now. Uh, a while back. And uh, you can see here again, uh, we have the different images here. So one of the things that we hear today, in fact, I was just at a rally for Beto O'Rourke in Texas, in El Paso, and they were, uh, the protesters against Beto O'Rourke were like, he doesn't, he's not an American, he doesn't wave a U.S. flag. And then, of course, I went to the rally and they were waving U.S. flags. But that's sort of been the charge, right? Like anti-American, uh, these folks are anti-American because they don't use U.S. flags. If you remember the 2006 immigration protests, people were carrying around U.S. flags, but there was all that criticism that people are being anti-American because they don't carry U.S. flags. And we see that right here in this picture in 1966. This goes way back that people are using the U.S. flag to claim that kind of nationality or that national identity, right? But we also have the Mexican flag and we have the UFW flag and a number of other uh, markers there that I, I think is pretty interesting. So let me um, give, play this clip for you. Uh, it's about two minutes long, um, but I think it's really important for you to hear Dolores Huerta in her own words. And I think this is going to work. I'm going to turn on this volume button now. Uh, we didn't have it on because of the kind of appearance, but. The
On behalf of the National Farm Workers Association, its officers, and its members, on behalf of all of the farm workers of this state, would unconditionally demand that the governor of this state, Edmund Brown, call a special session of the legislature to enact a collective bargaining law for the farm workers of the state of California. <laughs> with nothing less. The governor cannot and the legislature cannot shrug off their responsibilities to the Congress of the United States. We are citizens and we are residents of the state of California and we want the rules set up to protect us in this state right here. If the rules to settle our economic problems are not forthcoming, we will call a general strike to paralyze the state's agricultural economy. Cesar Chavez, if you're, you're interested. Um, and then the other video I have here that I, I don't think I'll play in the interest of time um, shows Cesar Chavez talking to that same audience in Spanish. And I think that that's really an interesting mix where she spoke in English and, and he spoke to the audience in Spanish. Um, but to give you a little bit more context, when they, so they marched from Delano to um, Sacramento and they're giving these speeches on the steps of the Capitol building, um, talking to, trying to talk to the governor and, and politicians in the state of California at that time. Uh, but the very last line that she says in, uh, that we heard right here, is she said that we may act in strange and unusual ways in our organizing, but we are willing to try new and unused methods to achieve justice for the farm workers. And the, the peregrinación is an example of that, trying to try new tactics and, and different <coughs> things that will bring attention to um, the social justice causes. And that, that was pretty important at the time, and you saw that in other civil rights movements as well. Um, but now we see um, media attention being used in different ways. And, and so um, what I think this speech illustrates then is, is the commitment to collaborative egalitarianism, but it also represents the courage and hope for a better world and, and the different ways in which they might go about that. Uh, as, um, so they're going to use these unusual methods and um, building from her Catholic roots that shaped her sense of faith and hope and optimism. So now I'm going to turn to that second part of my argument in this chapter, which is about courageous optimism and, and what that means in terms of differential bravery. Uh, so uh, here we see Dolores Huerta uh, probably working with people to sign union cards or sign some kind of document. Um, but one of the things that we can say about courage and optimism is that they're interlinked concepts and each begets the other. So the more optimism we feel, um, then we feel more optimism. And if we have more courage, then we have more courage. And that sounds uh, kind of circular, but it's interesting how that happens. Also, that having courage uh, often inspires optimism and optimism precipitates courage in that taking action or speaking out can lead to some positive result or benefit. Um, courage, bravery, optimism, hope, and faith are all concepts situated within a future orientation and that's really important that if we're stuck in the present or we keep thinking about what happens in the past, then it's really hard for us to think, okay, what, what are we going to be doing for the future? How are we going to change things on an individual level or a community level or a national or international level for that matter? Um, so a future orientation in a social, social or political movement then is essential for people to feel invested in their actions and rhetoric that can lead to trans transformation. Advocating hope, optimism, faith, and courage is also what enables someone like Huerta to believe in the self as an actor 
that an individual's actions can have impact. Often, whether the, and the UFW defined action as the ability to organize others through community organizing techniques, but without courage and optimism in both the self and others, the movement likely would have failed. So then the self is a key aspect in building courageous optimism, and Huerta regularly acknowledged her own self-doubts and insecurities about her role as a leader. She used her public persona to reflect courage and optimism, even if she did not always feel that way in her private thoughts and life. And so here, this quote, I'll read it. Uh, what she says is, one of the greatest things I have learned in the movement is courage. We really don't have courage when we have to make tough decisions. When Cesar asked me to work for the United Farm Workers Union, I was divorced, had seven children, and had been a school teacher. The, the decision took a lot of sweat. I learned to have courage. Working for a cause is the baptism of fire. Being involved is good because then you lose all types of fear. Then what really happens is you become strong. So bravery does not have to happen all the time, but we need a little bit of courage to get us started and to have those moments where we can take action. Bravery begets bravery, which can make our lives more satisfying, coherent, enjoyable, and enriched socially, economically, culturally, and politically. The peregrinación speech foreshadows the kind of crowd atmosphere and future for UFW advocacy, as we saw in those pictures in the video that we just watched. Um, courageous optimism for Huerta is also tied to individual and collective understandings of agency. Using one's sense of power is important in engaging others in collaborative action and the transmission of emotion and the atmosphere of the crowd and context of the situation are imminently essential for building hope. Huerta refers to this projective agency as power. So uh, one of the things she says, um, I want to check the year of this speech, uh, 2013 speech that she gave in El Paso, she says, the only thing you have to know is how to have power. So they would say, where's our power? What power do we have? And we would say, the power is in your person. The power is in your person. And when you come together with other people and you take direct action, then you can make things happen. Then you can make the changes. That's all you have to do. You have to remember you have power, but you can't do it by yourself. You gotta bring other people together with you, taking this nonviolent action. So this rhetoric of courageousness fosters a sense of optimism and vice versa, but faith is also central to this optimistic persona, as she noted, quote, we can make the changes as long as we have faith in ourselves. Faith, confidence, and optimism function rhetorically to inspire audiences and speakers that, that change can and will occur. Rather than allowing normative thinking to function as a rhetorical constraint, Wetherth's commitment to optimism reflects a future orientation that enables new possibilities and alternatives in collaborative and collective ways. Through Wetherth's public persona, establishing that sense of social hope was essential for the survival of the movement. The examples of self-sacrifice, optimism, and respect that UFW leaders had for the farm workers demonstrated that she and others really believed that they could succeed, even at times when they might have privately doubted themselves. So the differential consciousness and the emergence of courage, optimism, and egalitarianism uh, originate in family life and extend to one's social networks moving throughout life. The networks and support groups behind the face of leadership of any social movement are essential for that movement's success, as What Earth Is Life shows. She relied on key support people throughout her life to foster that sense of confidence, courage, and bravery that were so essential for taking fearless actions. And as we heard from the panel earlier today, there are all the different people in our lives who support and nurture us, and there are other people who don't. And sometimes that uh, they could be the same person who's doing the same thing, that both supporting and not supporting us, but it's, it's those moments where your mom makes you some food and that's really supportive, and then she says, why do you have to study so much uh, that the panel is talking about? And so how do we uh, take those moments of support and use those in productive ways and sort of say, well, I'm not gonna worry about that other one, but I'm gonna you know, kind of embrace this one and move forward with that. How do we focus on those positive moments of, of social support? Uh, so her, she was really able to do that very successfully, uh, and we know that, that social justice was a big part of that throughout her life. Um, so Huerta and Chavez both had to convince many farm workers that striking and boycotting and picketing was within their best interests. They used their own courage and their lives to inspire a generation of farm workers to take action that led to major UFW victories in the fields, in the state of California's assembly, in the national and international boycott campaigns, and in the US Congress. Huerta's enactment of differential bravery was essential not only for herself, for her own self, but the contagion of her bravery and optimism extended to an entire social movement. 
So um, what, ca what can we say then, what does this mean? Uh, I, I think when we think about differential bravery, to make one concluding observation then, that Huerta's life and the people in her life supported her and helped her become a, a leader, as I said, but it created that lifelong framework for that and understanding social justice issues through differential bravery. That is, um, her rhetoric critiqued dominant narratives and called for civil rights for farm workers, Chicana, Chicanos, Mexicanas, Mexicanos, and Mexican American communities, among others. Her optimism that action could address and potentially solve such problems allowed for her ongoing commitment to farm workers, even in the face of her own um, poverty. Her commitment to egalitarianism and collaborative action also meant that she understood, despite her own personal strengths, that social change cannot be accomplished alone. Enmeshing herself within communities, as did other farm worker leaders, such as Chavez, Gilbert Padilla, Larry E. Leong, was critically important for connecting with these audiences. Marshall Gantz, who was a key UFW organizer and leader, contends that so many other farm worker organizing attempts failed because leaders came from outside of those communities, where it's this differential bravery and ability to move among and within all kinds of groups, narratives, and structures adapting to each rhetorical situation, context, and audience reflect rhetorical maneuvers that are hard to come by. Her life illustrates complex intersectionalities related to class standing, race, gender, motherhood, single parenthood, and religion. Yet she subverted social expectations and cultural norms to become a well-known and outspoken advocate for those in marginal positions of US American society. Uh, so then we can think about the differential bravery as this kind of oppositional stance and this, this need that we have to have a little bit of bravery to take action. And I can say that I just did this on, on the UTEP campus in the past couple of weeks. We have a new president. Um, and I was really scared to speak out against her because I think she's going to be an awful president. But I felt that I had to take that action uh, because a lot of, I'm a tenured full professor at my institution. So I'm one of the few protected people, maybe. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> but I think, you know, sometimes I was like, I have to do this because a lot of other people are in precarious employment situations and can't speak out against her. And so um, I did try to do as much of that as I could. And it was really scary. Uh, and I was like, Dolores Huerta, what would she do? Um, so that's one of my, li my life mottos. Uh, but also the optimism and hope expand the sense of the possible. Sometimes we have a little bit of optimism and a little bit of hope. And taking that initial action can help us have even more optimism and hope. And the last thing I want to mention is that I think intersectional identities, some of which I just mentioned, class standing, race, gender, motherhood, uh, single parenthood, and religion, can be both constraining and enabling. Uh, so we see a lot of conflicting factors here. Like she was able to use her motherhood strategically, but not all the time, right? She was still struggling to figure out what her kids were going to eat, where they were going to stay, what clothes they would wear, even if she also took her kids to bargaining sessions and, and used her breastfeeding baby as a way to disrupt the meeting and to get what she wanted. And so um, there's a lot of in enabling and constraining factors that go into this idea of the differential. And we still always have to be thinking about that and navigating those circumstances. Um, so lastly, I wanted to just talk about what this might mean for some broader context. And this is really uh, some things that I unpack a little bit more in the book. But I think what's really important now is what's happening today. Um, obviously, on this day, she serves as inspiration as a social justice icon. Uh, I think you're probably here because you've heard the name Dolores Huerta before, or maybe you're getting some class extra credit. And uh, well, that's OK, too. Um, I'm, a, I'm a teacher. I know what students are motivated by. <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, but, but so much inspiration comes from that. And the idea that Washington State and New Mexico and California have recognized her through the state holiday is super important and exciting. Uh, the film that came out um, uh, in 2017, Dolor Dolores, the panel was talking about watching that film. And if you weren't here, I really encourage you to watch the film as well, because it's just such an amazing look at her life. And um, uh, my book is actually the first monograph book about Dolores Huerta. And that's pretty shocking. Not, I mean, I'm not a Chicana. I'm not 
Mexicana, and so for me to be the one who has, uh, that wrote this book is a little bit strange to me. Uh, and I think that, but I'm glad that I did because I want stuff out there about her, and I think that that's super important. Um, Mario Garcia, I do want to give him some credit, did put together a reader, and there's some kids' books, and there's actually some out there for sale. But it's just um, really important that we talk about Dolores Huerta, and not just Dolores Huerta, but there's also Helen Chavez and Jessica Govea and a number of other uh, leaders of the UFW and the Chicano movement that have been glossed over in history. So how can we be talking about their ways in which they inspire us for social justice? Um, I think it's also important for us to think about union organizing and what's happening with that, uh, that we have um, in Ciudad Juarez, which is the, the city across from me in El Paso, uh, Mexican workers are pushing to unionize, but what do we see happening in the United States? In Texas, I live in a right to work state. I used to live here and I can see such a notable difference from my time in the Cal State system versus the UT system. And it's pretty shocking to me about the kinds of rights that faculty have in the Cal State system with a what I would call a fr fairly strong union system uh, compared to UT, which basically has uh, very little protection in that way. Um, the, and then uh, the Supreme Court uh, last summer passed, uh, made a decision that has limited union power. So what does that mean, that unions are in decline or that aren't able to fight for workers' rights in the same way? So how are we going to advocate for workers' rights in this day and age? And, and I think we really need to be thinking about that. Obviously, farm worker protections. I didn't talk about this very much. Some major victories happened in the 1960s, the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s, and yet farm workers are still one of the most exploited classes of people in the United States. They are very vulnerable, and we still need to do a lot more to make sure that they're protected. We can't just say, well, um, you know, the UFW solved all the problems, because they didn't. They solved some problems. They banned the short-handled hoe, which was a huge victory. They got some bathrooms in the fields, but we know that, that farming companies are still resisting those changes, and, and we have to keep fighting for workers' rights. Uh, and then lastly, uh, maybe thinking a, a little bit about political activism and, and what that means. Uh, I think even myself, um, I'm a pretty active voter, but I think it can be very easy to become disillusioned in the voting process and to think that, that our votes don't matter, but we have to get out there. And, it can't, and this is a great example of how one person voting is not going to change a political system. It has to be us coming together and voting. Um, to make the changes that we want to see in our society. Uh, I'm sure I could go on for much longer on all of the broader contexts and what the UFW mean, but I think what's most important is that we recognize this history and the contributions of Huerta and others like her. And I thank you so much for being here tonight. I will, I think, take some questions if you have them. But thanks again for being here and being so attentive as an audience. I, get, I always get first question because I. He's I'm the organizer. Thank you, Oliver. I'm glad that Ross stays in here as long as my colleagues. But, um, so I'm very curious to hear your reaction to this idea of coalition building that you talked about and, and whether or not Dolores or other members of the UFW, um, you know, they have a long history, right? And so I'm really interested in the, the coalitions. When the speech that you played, she said, We are American citizens. And so when you think about the UFW and the union's relationship to undocumented immigrants, strike breakers, like the UFW and the American mm -hmm. Foundation today are some of the biggest supporters of immigration reform and organizing undocumented persons, but that didn't come about overnight. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious in looking through the records, like what did you see on mm -hmm. that question? Mm -hmm. Well, it's uh, so tricky. <laughs> you know, we have our inspiration and now we have to go, uh, we have to talk about uh, something that's a little bit more I mean, I think that when you're talking about union organizers, when you have strike breakers coming in, it makes the lives of the strikers so much more difficult. But at the same time, it's really hard to blame the strike breakers, um, scabs as they've been called, uh, not so positively. And so, you know, the UFW at, in, the, in the 60s and the 70s were not that supportive. Um, I read, I came across a document that talked about how they were um, calling, uh, what was it called then in the 60s? Um, I want to say ICE, but of course it wasn't ICE then. Uh, but they, they were calling Border Patrol to come into the fields to pull out strike breakers. And that sounds really horrible when you're reading it on the page out of the, that historical context. But at the same time, we know that strike breakers make striking very, very difficult. And 
it diminishes the success and it makes the lives of the strikers that much harder because it just draws out the strike so much longer. Um, but yeah, that is a very difficult history to talk about. Um, I would say that today, so one of the things that happened kind of moving into the 80s is that the UFW started to s shift strategies and they started focusing more on political lobbying and political activism and less on uni union organizing. And so that made it easier because they're not focusing on the strike so much as they're focusing on um, the rights of farm workers in, in California and elsewhere. So it makes it easier to support undocumented folks' rights because it's not in direct opposition or it's not you know, about strike breaking, it's about supporting people who are in marginal positions. But yeah, that's, that's a very difficult um, criticism. And that, I do talk about that briefly in the conclusion chapter. Yes? Mm -hmm. And how, you know, her English is perfect. In terms of an intersectional influence, how did her appearance and her ability to speak perfect English, how did that, do you believe that influenced her movement and her So what I think it meant, I mean, I think lots of people spoke perfect English and there's sort of the, like, um, an assumption that people may not have, but I think lots of people spoke perfect English. Hi, daughter. <laughs> uh, but I think that what it meant is that she took on more of the lobbying roles in the state assembly and also in, in across the nation. She did a big boycott in, she organized a boycott and lived in New York for a while. And I think she was successful because she was able to reach out. So I, I don't know about, she is very beautiful. I don't know how much she used that strategically, but she does talk about how difficult it was and how much sexism there was within the UFW, within farm worker communities, um, within every aspect of society and, and how challenging that was. And I think that that's a place where I, I, beauty can be a constraining and enabling factor as well. Let me go over here real quick. Uh, I don't know who had their hand up first, but yes. I'm wondering, I know you have a chapter on this. Um, I've read about people saying they didn't want to sit across the table from her because she was emotional or a dragon lady or almost describing her as hysterical, which I thought was sexism. But you kind of talk about it in your book as it being a rhetorical strategy that she used her womanly wiles, her passion and emotions, even her tears. It's a different, I mean, am I wrong? Like that's. She talks about that herself, that sometimes she would cry strategically as a way to get what she wanted. Um, I don't want to, you know, say that she did that without her saying that first, uh, because, and you know, I don't really call it the womanly wiles, but, but, uh, but she does talk about using emotions strategically and how people, but I mean, I think that, again, speaking to your question, is about that kind of sexism and, and how people responded to her. Uh, they said some really awful things about her. And you know, she was often pregnant because she had 11 children. So she had at least 11 pregnancies um, and was breastfeeding her children and you know, doing all of these, these um, activities in child rearing. Uh, so yeah, she did. But I think, I think an interesting question is, did that as both the enabling and constraining factor, right? On some ways, it probably helped her to be more successful because they might say, oh, I don't want to deal with Dolores Huerta. Let's just like end this bargaining session a little bit sooner. But on the other hand, they would walk out and say she's crazy. And so you could see it going both ways, right? That sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. I think you had a question. Mm -hmm. uh, or I guess the typical influence as well. Mm -hmm. um, so both Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta talk about being influenced by Fred Ross, who was the community service, uh, community service organization head. And he was influenced by Saul uh, Alinsky. And so that was a big influence through Fred Ross and then uh, Gandhi nonviolent strategies, uh, tactics that, that Gandhi promoted, uh, Martin Luther King. Um, other civil rights activists of the time. Mm -hmm. Probably some others. I'd have to go back to my notes on that one, but that's what I remember. Any other questions? 
I will ask one more, and that's Andrew. Yeah, Andrew, you go first. Oh, I was actually just going to tag in because you brought up Ty Ross. If anyone's interested in reading a great book on him, Gabriel Thompson wrote uh, uh, America So Far Since We Had Him Here, and he talked about Ty Ross as sort of like uh, Huerta and Chavez's mentor and like the influences kind of coming from Salinsky going through him. Mm -hmm. So there's some really cool stuff there. In your mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it would pair great with your book. Mm -hmm. I like that. <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask Stacy if you could share a little bit about um, like interviewing Dolores because I mean she's uh -huh. such a public figure. Like, uh -huh. um, you know, what are some of the insights that you remember from doing doing that interview? Those those little nuggets. That uh -huh. Well, she's one of the reasons I have my daughter today. Uh, I I was a professor and I was like, oh, I don't have time to have children. I was probably about 35 at the time. Uh, it was 2006. Um, I had invited her to come speak at UTEP, and she stayed at my house, and so uh, she was fasting because it was during the time of the, the 2006 immigration protests. I think it was March or April when she came, um, but there was, I don't know if you all remember this, but massive immigration protests, and that was 13 years ago, so now I'm starting to realize that some of my students were like very, very young and don't remember that. But I remember it so vividly because I participated them in El Paso and um, it was on the news and I wrote a paper about it and it was a pretty exciting time. But she came and she stayed at my house and so um, I was interviewing her and she's like, well, you know, having kids is the most important thing you can do. Like after this amazing life that she's had, that's what she says. And I mean, she has 11 kids, so you know, it makes sense that she thinks that. And she, she just says, well, you just have them, and then you work it out, and that's how you do it. And uh, like that really stuck with me. And then I was like, okay, maybe I can have kids. And you know, here's my three and a half year old daughter. It took a while to, for me to get there, <laughs> uh, but but there she is. Um, so that's one thing I remember. Um, I interviewed her again when she came for the showing of the Loris, the the film, and um, what struck me not so much about asking her questions, but people wanted to take pictures with her. And so that was two years ago, so she was, what, 87? And she just stayed and took pictures with every single person. I mean, it was incredible. Hundreds of people um, went to the, the films, and she just stayed and took pictures with every single person. Um, the, and just the stamina that she has is really incredible. And seeing it right there when she's 87 years old, taking pictures with people. Yeah. <coughs> Anything else? Caroline has one right here. Oh, yeah. I'm still thinking about the kids. I have seven myself. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's why I only have one. Uh, <laughs> did, you, did you get any information on how she worked it out? Did you have family supporting her? Or did they watch each other? Well, so, so she talks about this too, but um, in the letters that she was writing, she, was, she would say, oh, okay, I'm going to have a babysitter right now, and then the kids are going to be in school, and then this kid's going to be staying at this house, and that kid's going to be staying at that house, and my ex-husband's going to take those two. So she, was all, like, she would just write in these letters, like, w the kids are going here, and I'm going to have this babysitter, and I need money for the gas card, and my electricity is going to be shut off, and I need an outfit for the communion for this kid. And I mean, it's just really fascinating how she's like, trying to navigate all of these different people in her life, and somehow she just did it. Um, it's easy to, easy to say that now, I suppose, but. <laughs> yeah. More like a comment than a mm -hmm. question, because uh, disclosure, I work for the current high school district, mm -hmm. and um, there was a group of entities that uh, sued the district for discriminatory practices, disciplinary practices against students, uh, mainly minorities and African American students, and uh, the district had to settle Even though it was a group of five different entities that presented the lawsuit, Dolores gets blamed for everything now in the district. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Like, you know, yeah. Can I, can I add to that for Stacey's context yeah. here? I mean, this goes back to my original question about Dolores' life, her foundation. It, it transcends so much of history. Like, you're, you're just filling in, like, one stopgap. I mean, and one of the reasons I wanted to invite you here was to let students know, young people know that this legacy is here and folks from UTEP and Yale and Brown and Harvard all research about the valley, right? But there's so much history here that it's left to be uncovered, you know? And mm -hmm. my hope is, is that students get inspired to talk to their parents, to do interviews, and to know that like other people are telling this 
this narrative in El Paso and all across the country. Well, we need like 19 more books about Dolores Huerta so she can catch up with Cesar Chavez. We need books about Jessica Govea. We need books about Helen Chavez. We need, I mean, there's so much more to be done. So, and so I don't want to be the person to do those books, right? So, so two weeks ago, we screened Adios Amor, which is the story of Maria Moreno, who worked for AWOC and who was the first farm labor woman hired by a union. And Lori's next project, she wants to do it on on, on Jessica Govea. Good, was excellent. She was in Bakersfield College, mm -hmm. she was in the union, absolutely. Mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's great. That's good. <laughs> Any last questions? Well, let's give Stacy a round of applause. <laughs> so I just have a couple of closing uh, announcements and reminders. Like, one, the book is for sale. If you 